um, if it is based on technical learning, I think if anybody definitely has questions that they'd like me to address, um, particularly if you have any questions regarding the assessment, I would be happy to address them in the chat box. But in the meantime, I guess I'll just go through what I had prepared um, and a little bit of theory that would help you, I guess, build your foundation of understanding GIS, QGIS, and how you can apply that for climate resilience. So when we talk about GIS, we know that it deals specifically with location, but one thing as a technological field is constantly changing. Um, and when we think of decisions that we make every day, these involve spatial decisions like which bus do I catch, which route do I take, um, that's the fastest to go to work. These are all spatial decisions that GIS really informs. So it's constantly in our everyday lives, um, but it's also, um, in policies, you know, at the national level, something that Leslie was talking about. So for the foundational understanding of GIS, um, how it works is really invaluable currency as maybe a surveyor, you know, in the different fields that you're currently working in. So if you are getting into GIS or QGIS, one thing that I would always recommend is relying on the community, um, the open community in particular, because of the availability of information that you do have. So when we talk about the open community, they really promote um, the transparency of solutions for governance, um, for social and economic opportunities, but also for environmental opportunities. And these are scalable solutions that have no licensing costs, which is really important when you're thinking about adopting open solutions. And in this, um, in this module, I guess, we're using QGIS, which you would know is an open project of OSGEO. And the main functionality of it is integration. Um, Leslie had touched on data and interoperability. Think of integration as um, a stack of software um, or infrastructure that helps us make these decisions that need to be linked to each other. Um, and so the open source community really functions under integration. And there's a range of uh, topical communities that you can be a part of, that you can really um, grow your information. Right, so in terms of climate resilience and QGIS, um, if you go through the assessment, you'll learn a little bit about plugins. You'll also learn about um, loading data sets into them and making some decisions. And the power of QGIS is not only is it free, but because of integration um, and because of its open licensing costs, there's tons of plugins that you can use to make decisions, particularly for climate resilience. And a good example that's kind of been applied in different areas of the country, uh, sorry, <laughs> of the world, is um, a project known as Innisafe that helps you make some decision based on um, risk modeling. And this is a plugin that you can easily integrate and use in QGIS, but you need to learn, I guess, the fundamental basics of a GIS system and GIS as a background uh, to really work on, uh, utilize systems like this. So I'm gonna to touch a little bit on theory and then we can address some, uh, some technical aspects using QGIS. So um, as I mentioned, to be successful in GIS or even QGIS is really the fun foundational knowledge, which is what you will step through in your activities document. Um, independent learning and research is really something that is encouraged and you will kind of have the enthusiasm um, as you go through it. So as I mentioned, the open community, there's tons of information available. So you have something called docs, it's always available. Um, and it allows you to branch out. Like if you learn how to use QGIS, you'll be able to learn other systems like Blender and how you can integrate that to make better maps. You probably even learn about Postgres, which is a massive, enterprise database system that you might branch into. Um, but let's talk some theory before I get lost in it. So as you step through your model, you'll notice that you're dealing with two different types of data models. And these two are known as vector and raster data. So when you think of vector data, these are geometry. So your points, your lines, your polygons. Think of how you represent your roads, how you represent your houses, how you represent um, trees, for example. We can use geometry to represent this in a map. 
And then you also have rust data, which is cells or grid of pixels. So when you take your photo, you know, that's actually a raster data set. So an example of a raster data set that you would have worked with in your assessment is really the population density. If you've gone through it, you'll notice you don't really step through a lot of information that deals with the raster data because we're not performing anything too complex. Um, but it's just to get a feel of how raster data works in a GIS system. So there's two types of data models and which one do you choose? It's really based on the processing, uh, what you're trying to do in a GIS system. So when you think of data set, these are discrete features, right? Um, and it's really used to display geometries, calculate area, for example. So if you want to calculate the area of a forest, you can easily do that using vector data. But you can even do that with raster data. Um, but raster, is actually more commonly used for spatial analysis and modeling. Then we touch a little bit on projections in the assessment. So this is how we represent reality in our 2D space or in our QGIS map window. And it's chosen based on the needs of our analysis. So if you step through the assessment, you notice we changed our projection to the PDC Mercator. And the reason we do that and I can show you, <clears throat> is really because we're looking at working with data um, that's for the Pacific or for Fiji in particular. And the data that we, um, sorry, the way Fiji um, is shown on a map, um, a global map, is that it's split into two. Um, so changing this to really have the whole picture of what Fiji looks like or the region looks like is really important. And that's why that's the particular reason why we're using um, uh, Fiji, uh, the PDC Makita. So I've just loaded into in my geoboundaries and you notice one portion of the world has um, some islands of Fiji, and then you go to the other portion of the world, and then you have the rest of Fiji. And this is because of the 180 meridian, which I've explained. So I'm just going to change this really quickly. And this is really the purpose. This is fit for purpose projections, while we're the reason why we change uh, projections. Where did we go? Right, so now we have the whole of Fiji, okay? Then go back to what I was saying. <laughs> right, so there's two distinctions of projections. You have your geographic and your projected projection systems. So these are two distinctions. So just think of geographic coordinate systems as latitude and longitude, and your projected coordinate system as X and Y. Um, um, and these are usually in linear uh, meters, uh, units, so meters. So we're able to do better calculations. And then there are different ways our Earth can be projected. So you have cylindrical, conical, and flat as the methods of projection. And the thing that you have to understand is map projections are never really accurate. That's why you have to select them for the purpose um, that your analysis is for. Whatever projection you select, there will always be distortions. So if I had worked in a global projection to do some calculations for Fiji, there would definitely be distortions in terms of area in terms of distance, because Fiji is right at the corner of, um, sorry, the ends of the global projection. But because I changed it into a region specific projection that works for Fiji, I'm able to do better calculations and it reduces these kinds of distortions, right? And you might not notice it, um, but as you start working with more data or you get involved in GIS, then you'll definitely notice things like this happening. Okay, so we've touched these. Yeah, and this is exactly why we need to understand projections. Um, <laughs> it's look through the activities document, um, some spatial analysis and geoprocessing. So these are activities that we step through to derive an end result. And geoprocessing methods, for example, are really used for the modeling portions uh, to complete our analysis. So this is an example of how you'd step through some geoprocessing. It's just putting some data into a tool <laughs> to derive more data that actually makes a little bit more sense, right? 
So the geoprocessing tools that you've used so far would be the buffer tool, the clip tool, right? These are two of the most common uh, geoprocessing tools that we've used. Um, but there are other uh, geoprocessing tools that I could probably talk about, but I think I should just step to the, because we don't have a lot of time remaining. <laughs> but if anyone has any questions, uh, please put them in the chat box. Um, I wanted to talk more so about the assessment and the activities that you step through. So the reason you go through these steps is really to build some foundational understanding of what is exactly is going on in terms of the geographic space, how you're layering um, all these different data sets to derive some decisions. So this is an example of what you would step through. You load your layers, you uh, change your projection style, overlay these layers again, then you probably reproject one of these layers, query them to generate some information, do some select, um, select by location and some clips. And this is actually the step that you would take to derive your assessment um, results. So I'll touch on these in the next seven minutes. Um, right. So one thing I have probably had emphasized that I hope you read through is to always store your data in a C drive where you're able to access it. So I'm just going to quickly access my map document. Or did I create a map document? <laughs> Okay, wait, no, I know I did. It's in here. Yeah, okay. So when you save your map document, this has all the layers that you've added into it and it's also uh, saved the styling. So this is exactly what I would want to add of my Nandi processing layer. But you start working with data sets that are more global. So you're working with a population data set for a portion of Nandi. You're working with the geo boundaries, you're working with your elevation data set, you're working with buildings for the western portion and storm tricks. So we do a quick query, which is really not really changing much of the data set. We're just interested in one particular portion. Um, and to do that query, you need to right click on your data set in the layers panel, access your properties. This is where you get your information about your data set, right? Where it's stored what kind of file is it? It's a shape file, which is very common in GIS. Um, it's a geometry, the, it's a polygon geometry. You get the CRS, which is the coordinate reference system. And it's in a geographic coordinate system. Remember, remember that. <laughs> um, and then you have the extent, the unit. But we're going to build a query into this because we're only interested in the Nandi area. And I'm able to pull this because it has a shape name, right? Each feature in this data set has a shape name, um, which is really like the town name. So I've got my Nandi layer locked and loaded. I'm just going to check my projection system and make sure it's in the PDC Makeda. So always make sure you check your projection just in case. Um, when you're overlaying layers, it starts to get a bit complicated. So you wanna make sure that you're overlaying them correctly on top of each other. So now we've got our layer loaded and to access your layer styling, you can either access them from the properties um, and then you get a symbology panel where you're able to style it here, but it's not really that intuitive. So the best thing to do is load a layer styling panel, which you can access from view panels and then you get layer styling right so you can toggle it off and then I'll just toggle it on and on the top you have the layers that you're able to style which I'm doing now which is I hope this one um, <clears throat> you can style them based on categories which is actually what we do for the buildings lab but I'm just going to leave that and I'm just going to make it transparent because I want should I make it transparent? Oh, one thing that's really cool is when you're changing the colors of your layer, you're able to just drag and drop the color um, to see what you're doing. Yeah. Um, sorry, you're able to drag and drop instead of trying to match each color in each view. 
Okay, so I've got my geo boundaries now. And what we do from this after is our extent layer. So I'm going to go into vector and to geo process. Was it geo process? Sorry. Uh, it's research tools, and I'm going to extract the extent for my Nandi boundary. So you can save this into your file, or you can run it. I'm going to run it like this to create a temporary layer so that I can do this fairly quickly. All right. So now I've got my extent for the Nandi area. And you do perform a clip to clip your population data set, but you also do a clip to perform on your um, elevation data set. So to do that, you go again to vector, to your processing and clip. So this will basically think of it as like a mathematical operation, because that's exactly what it is you're taking a bigger layer and then you're using like the extent of it to cut it out. So like a cookie cutter in a way. <laughs> um, so my input layer will be my elevation data set and then the extent. Right, so now I have my clipped data set. So this is all the elevation um, for this Nandi extent. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a graduated symbology just to show me what the elevation looks like. So you can invert your color ramp or you can choose a more intuitive color ramp that makes sense, right? <clears throat> so we know where there's lighter colors in particular, for example. Where there are lighter colors, this is where, um, yeah, this is lower areas of elevation and the darker colors would mean high areas of elevation. I'm just gonna turn on my OSM standard map again. So there's tons of um, color apps that you can play around with. Just choose the one that is quite intuitive that would help you make, I guess, some inferences as you step through the activity. All right, so that's the elevation layer done. Then I think the most important one is actually the storm as I've seen some people having trouble with that. So I've got my extent here. And then I've got the storm tracks that have been selected for the Fiji area in particular. And this was just using a um, select by location. And the select by location, you can find it in your select uh, tab, which is here. So where did we go? Oh, wow. If you face issues with the data set, uh, data sets taking a while to load, it's really because of the, um, it's because of the base maps that you put in. Uh, you're just trying to connect to the internet. I hope my internet, I'm not, I hope I'm not buffering. Oh, yeah. Just gonna remove that. Sometimes you might get a crash. QGIS does tend to crash, but it's really local issues. So it could be your internet connectivity that's struggling <laughs> to load, um, which is unfortunate, but it does happen. Let me see. I'm probably going to crash my... Oh, 10... Okay, we actually got an extra 10 minutes. Thanks. That's great. <laughs> But does anyone have any questions so far before I keep rambling on? Um, okay, maybe not. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to trash this. <laughs> Probably my internet. Um, I'm gonna open the data set again. So I'm just gonna use the map file that I saved and that's the importance of my map file. But basically I'm stepping through the steps um, for the assessment. So if you look back into the assessment document, um, there's only two parts. And I say only, like it's easy, it's not. Um, it is, but if you complete and read through the detailed instructions, you'll be able to not only answer all the questions, you'll be able to run the independent analysis, um, even though it's a little bit more work. 
Um, hopefully QGIS loads because if it doesn't, well, it, it always does. <laughs> it just takes a while. Um, not that it's an issue. Um, yeah, so basically the two geoprocessing tools that you step through um, are buffer and clip. You do do some reprojection, you do do some uh, select and filters, you play around with the attributes in a way. Um, but the other interesting one I think that's important to know is the merge tool where you're able to combine data sets. Um, and this preserves the data from one layer. But if you want to keep the data for all layers, then you need the union tool. So this is what the clips layer and the clipping extent that I had just performed is supposed to look like. And then this is the um, overarching original layer. And then yeah, the buffer tool. Yeah, so this is just the merge, the dissolve. Dissolve is just removing boundaries that have similar attributes. So if you are, what's a good explanation? Say you have suburbs in a state, you can dissolve by state and this will dissolve all the suburbs. It's just to unify boundaries basically. And then you have your intersection, which is just cutting out. It's like a, it's not really a cookie cutter, but it's cutting out layers that overlap uh, each other. Then you have your union, which I mentioned is similar to a merge, but you maintain all the boundaries and all the information. And then you have an erase, which is like a, sort of like a cookie cookie cutter, but no. How did I conduct the category style layering of the, oh, cool, sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll go through that. So the category data, we love data, we love questions. I'm gonna, it does not show on display screen even when I connect to the internet. I hope it's the data. I hope we're talking about the base. Uh, sorry. I hope when you mean the data that it's not. I hope you mean that it's not the uh, OpenStreetMap layer. But um, one thing that might be the issue with you, uh, the data sets, Priscilla, is the projection. So I think, I hope you had seen when I had loaded in the Fiji layer, the default projection of QGIS is always WGS84. And this is um, a global projection. Um, and because Fiji is so small, it's actually on different ends of the earth. <laughs> so if I turn on the geo boundaries, which I just had, right, and I, let me just remove the filter really quickly. I'm going to source query builder, clear that. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so if I zoom to the layer, this might be the issue that, that you're getting, Priscilla. You might not be able to see the, that Fiji is split into two different areas. So you just need to change your projection. And you can access the projection from project, go to properties. Um, and then there's a CR, CRS layer here. And what you do is you just type in the, either the number that I provided 3832 or PDC Mercator, and you should be able to select this and then right click on your layer again and then click zoom to layer. So it should load <laughs> if it wants to. Sorry, let me just remove that. Out of all days, my QGIS is when I run select by location, the tool I didn't get. I'm facing problem to export. Okay, um, facing the issue to export your data. That's fine. Uh, so when you run a select by location. I think I had mentioned to run the, oh, I know why it's not loading. Let me just remove this really quickly. I'll just remove some of the layers and then I'll just add in the boundaries again. I really won't let me. 
Okay, so let me change the prediction again. Uh, it's getting great. Right? Okay, cool. Um, took a while to get there. <clears throat> okay, so let me just answer the question. So I'm just going to style the elevation data because that was the first question that I didn't address. Um, so I have my elevation data turned on here. So the way that you would style this, I'm just going to turn everything off, is you need to turn on the layer styling panel, which you can access from view panels, layer styling. Okay, that's where you access it from. And this will, it'll turn, uh, it'll turn on this really cool panel on the right hand side of your QGIS window. Um, usually it would select which layer that you're working on, which is the NAND elevation, you can select it yourself, right? And then you're changing it from single symbol, which is um, just underneath the data, the layer, and you change it to graduated, right? So graduated is just think of steps <laughs> or continuous data, uh, Just it's just a color ramp. So you need to change the value from ID to elevation so you can style it by groups of elevation, right? And click on classify at the bottom. Make sure you have a color ramp selected. But then what you can do as well is you can invert the color ramp if you click down on the button um, and change and select whichever color ramp you think makes sense when you think of elevation and how to display it on a map, right? Okay. Let me tackle other questions. Um, editing the attribute table data, the cyclone feel. Okay, so when you're working with your buildings layer, which I'm turning on now, the way that you add your data set is you go into, ah, sorry, not properties. You can access your attribute table from your layer. So right click um, and open attribute table this side and to add a column into your data set you need to turn on this button uh this pencil here to turn on editing right and then just across on the same panel you'll have a little yellow pencil with a star a yellow star that's to add a new field or column in QGIS they call columns few, uh, fields which is mind-blowing to me um so this is where you add your cyclone field, right? To see whether it's been impacted. Um, and then I selected a text string, I believe, and the length was just one for yes and no. All right, so already because I have created this field here, but what I can do is I will just delete it and then we can redo it together because I've seen someone talking as well about cyclone, cyclone field. One. <clears throat> okay, great. So I've created it here. It's empty. And then what you need to do is uh, fill in the field. I'll show you how to do that. Let me just make sure that I'm downloading the data set under overlay and Liz has been challenging so far. I can't seem to. Okay. So I think in the, <laughs> sorry, that is the wrong window. <laughs> so in the, in this section here, I think it was to download data sets like this, right? So I noticed some of you also had challenges. There's actually a drive folder where I've already downloaded these data sets if you face issues. Um, so the link, I'll put it, um, it, I'll put it into the, the link for the data set. Oh, it's here, the drive is here. Um, let me just put the link here so that, in the chat so that you can access that. Um, and then when I run select by, I didn't get to save this. Okay, so we'll do that. There's select by location. So to run your select by location, I'm just gonna turn off my editing. Um, I'm gonna turn on my buffer, my <laughs> buildings. Um, and a geo boundary. Where have my buildings gone? Okay, let me just make them single symbols. There we go. So this is my buildings layer. 
um, and you wanted the select by location. Okay, so I'm going to do a select. But I know you didn't select the buildings by a clip. Uh, you didn't select them by select by location, but you did a, a clip instead. But another way to do this is run a clip. Uh, sorry, I'm confusing everyone, I think. Um, <laughs> let me just clear it out. Um, so the way that you selected your buildings that fell within the buffer, you ran a you ran a clip, and that's what's detailed in the um, book. But if you understood what you were doing in terms of the select by location and the clip, you'll notice you can actually do the same with the select by location using the buffer as an extent. Um, so I'll do that just to tackle these things, two things together. So I'm going to go to my select by location, <laughs> which is, where is my tool? Um, yeah, go select by location. So I'm going to select the buildings that are within the buffer. So I have my five kilometer buffer and I'm going to create a new selection in the Nandi buildings, right? Blair. So I'm going to run this. Has it selected anything? Only time will tell. I'm going to open my attribute table just to make sure that there's something selected. Right. So those that are within this five kilometer buffer, I've got something selected here, which is interesting. And the way that you would export the selected information is you go to the data set that you used to select these features. So it's my buildings layer. You can go to export, right click on the layer, go to export. And there's something here called save selected features as, right? So this is exporting your layer, but you're exporting the features that have been selected based on your query. So I can say this as my, you know, and at the bottom here, there's something underneath encoding. It's a checkbox where it says save only selected features. So I'm doing that now. And then what I do have is two different data sets, right? So I've got the buildings that are out within the boundary and then the buildings that cover the entire um, Nandi area, if that makes some sense. Hopefully it does. Yeah. Okay. Um, I hope that answers your question, Kim. So one thing I'll be doing is in the next couple of days, I guess, or hours, I'll still be online um, answering questions. I've seen a ton of people ask questions on the um, yeah, we need to leave in 2076. Um, on the MOOC, so leave a comment there. Or what you can do is under your assessment, you can um, message me privately questions about your assessment, and I'll definitely help you there. Um, but also, I think I had sent an email in the last couple of days. Some of you have asked for extension, so I'm moving that to next week. 